simulations. I'd like to see a real evolution happening out here in the wild. This is a trend but even with stick insects, it would take too long in real time. But I can show you evolution happening in the computer. You know, 40 years now, people have been doing these numerical simulations. I call and these creatures biomorphs, help, uh, and they really are quite biological to look at. Like That's no accident, students, because they develop by a simple people, branching rule, um, which is quite like the way some animals and plants develop. I understand biology better. The one in the center is the so parent the ones, of the current generation. This sort, Around is it this one by are 14 Ralph children. So I've here. just chosen also see which child I want to breed from for the next generation, and you see it move to the center, and now its progeny are being bred. I choose that one, moves to the and center so to become the parent of paper. the next generation. As you look at the children, you <coughs> see that they're slightly different from the parent, but nevertheless quite similar to it as well. And that's because the shape of them is controlled by what I call genes. They inherit the genes from the parent, and the genes really are quite closely analogous to genes in real animals. Let me show you how the genes work. First of all, so we'll we've already done some of this in zoom in and class. get a detailed look we at one of the biomorphs. There it is, an enlarged version yeah. of the parent of the previous generation. And that's basically generation. all they're doing here. They're just generating Now, each one of the genes, which are represented over okay. on the right here, um, and because it has gold on it, they like using big words that no one else knows. So in this case, nomothetic paleontology versus ideographic paleontology. Okay. And what you're trying to get at is not only paleontology, according to them, you try to explain, you know, each little thing. So why did T. rex go extinct? Why did Triceratops go extinct? Why did, you know, this group of flowers speciate? Okay? Each in real detail. And what they're trying to do here is say, take a step back and look at the overall pattern. Right? So it's like looking at each coin flip, you know, you explain why did it get heads on this turn? Well it's because of my initial impulse. It's because of viscosity of the air, because of what, exactly how high I put my hand, that sort of thing, right? So there's actually a reason for each little coin flip why it turned out heads and tails. But the bigger story is that half the time it's going to be heads, half the time it's going to be tails. Maybe it's not that important to know what's the viscosity of air around his hand, and is he sweating a lot, is that effective, right? And so they're saying, okay, we've been doing a lot of this, you know, analyzing each coin toss. Let's just take a step back and see what do we expect overall. And what they're trying to get at is in paleontology, so we have the phylogeny. People often then group it into clades, okay, and do something called a spindle diagram. Okay. So you'll see a diagram of something like this. And you'll see, you know, these were crinoids. Um, this is some person today. And then we had, you know, Dinosaurs, and then you know, KT, and then birds. Right, so you so show for a clade, you can collapse the tree and say, okay, rather than showing you all the branches, I'm going to show you actually just like the width, you know, the number of species at any given point in time. Look at that through time. Okay? And if that's still done in paleontology a bit, it's not done in neontology, the study of things that aren't extinct yet. Um, that much. It's kind of interesting to think about why, right? Um, <coughs> that's our idea. And so people were, were interpreting these and saying, okay, why did we get this, you know, decrease here? Why did they stop exactly here? Sort of They're saying, well, a lot of it's just sort of noise. You just sort of expect certain distribution. And so they did these little simulations. And you can see, like, the state of our, of the art computer graphics here. Okay? Let's do dashes. Like that. Um, they did simulations through time, and then they had a, this computer do a grouping thing to say, okay, now we have my tree, let me lump this group of things into a clade. Okay, so I can make a spindle diagram. Okay. Not going to a problem with doing a, a diversification simulation. If you like a practical issue with it. How do trees grow? 
at what rate? Suppose so I have, 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 a, have a group, and the speciation rate is twice the extinction rate. Right? What should happen to the number of species over time? It should increase. At what rate? Right? So you expect it to keep increasing and keep sort of doubling. Right? Not necessarily doubling. At what sort of rate? It's going to do up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's a technical term. Right. It's going to increase exponentially. Okay? Does it, make, does it make sense why? It's like bacteria, right? Have one bacterium and then it divides at some rate and I get two. Each of those can divide and I get four and so forth, right? Well, same thing with trees, right? I have one species. I have to wait some amount of time, then it speciates. And now, if it's expected to take, you know, 10 million years to get this first speciation event, and I have to wait until only one of these has speciation event, the next double, and that's the next increase, not double, right? So it might take, on average, 10 million years um, for one, but now I have two, and so this might happen at seven million years, by chance, right? And so forth. And now I have many more lineages continuing, and it keeps growing exponentially, right? Now, if you're using a computer in 1973, this could be a problem, right? Actually, using a computer in 2012 is a problem. So some of the work we're doing in our lab, you know, this week, involves simulating trees under a process like this, and worrying about you know, is it going to take up too much RAM or is it going to take an infinite amount of time? You start having like huge, giant trees, right? Um, there's another shit that happens too. So even as, let's say that there is birth rate twice that of death rate, but death rate is non-zero. What can happen? So if my speciation rate equals 2, and my extinction rate equals 1. And I start off with, say, two species. What can happen? <laughs> On average, right? But... Okay. I'm starting off here. I have twice the rate of going that way as this way. Right? What's going to happen? On average, I go that way. Right? Will I always go that way? No. There's some chance I'll first take a step this way, take a step this way, and eventually it will collapse. Right? Because I'm not here anymore. <laughs> right? Now, if this way lies extinction, and I start with two, two species, sometimes it can go this way and increase. There's a good chance I'll just happen to have extinction first and extinction get, you know, both snake eyes twice in a row. Right? <laughs> so you happen to, you know, and if you're rolling, you know, thousands of times, if you're okay, you can, you can take your hits. But if you start off with, you know, one dollar on the table, and you roll snake eyes first, then you're out of money. Right? <coughs> and so you get the same sort of thing with simulations, right? So we start off with two species. Sometimes it'll happen to roll two, you know, bad rolls and go extinct. Because okay, so another issue leads to issues with simulations, right? If you want to get a certain number of trees, and most of the trees are going extinct, you keep something more and more and more. Okay. So how do they deal with this? They assume basically logistic growth. Okay. Where, have you, where have you seen logistic growth before? <coughs> mm -hmm. So what, what's, what, what's that model about? Mm -hmm. right. And it stabilizes, but it doesn't like stay exactly at that cap, right? There's still fluctuations, okay? And that's their model here. Okay, they have this basically a discrete time model, and you get up to the cap, and then at that point, you're, so here, your death rate is very low and your birth rate is very high. Here, they're about equal. So you can wander around, but if you get to start getting too low, then your birth rate gets higher, you go back up, start getting too high, your death rate gets too high and start going back down. Okay. So it keeps you from 
hitting too high or too low. Okay? Too high, taking all your computer's RAM and destroying your computer. Too low, everything going extinct. Okay? So it's convenient. Is it realistic? Why, why do you say that? Okay, so th this is a very deep thought here. So, um, the idea that you know reality is a very very complex sy 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 system, and any model you're going to have is going to be a much a great simplification of that. So that's good. What about logistic growth itself? Is it a good approximation to reality? And I mean, and the other point you're making is that, you know, so yeah, we have leaders of growth, but are we here or are we here? <coughs> is that right? Okay. What else? So in ecology, what limits your size? When you have a leadership growth model, why do you have a leadership growth model? What is K? Right. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Right. Which you don't have to specify the model, you just say that. K is 25. Right. What's the equivalent for speciation and extinction? The slope would be the rate. <coughs> the carrying capacity is this up here, right? The thing it equilibrates at. Right? But why would the number of species get a carrying capacity? What does that mean? Right, I mean, you, have, you keep having speciation and extinction, right? But at some point, so if it gets, so if it gets higher than that, the extinction rate increases. If it gets lower than that, the extinction rate decreases. Or it could be speciation during the, the shifting, or, or both, right? But basically, it's the model that assumes that there's some sort of fixed number of species you can get to, right? If the number of species keep increasing without bound, you wouldn't have it. So it would be, you know, it would be uh, going to the ceiling. But instead, we have this idea that there's so many, only so many species we can have. Does that seem like a realistic assumption to you? Why? Because you only have so many individuals in certain You have a whole bunch of species, just a few species, and you're still going to be bound by the carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. So there must be at least two male and female per species. So, okay. Does anyone disagree with that view?
what people think. Um, if, if more species are able to occupy more than just one. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, the ideas we are generating are all ideas that are talked about in literature. Right? There's the idea that there is, I mean, there is some absolute bound probably of you need to have a few individuals per species. Right? And so the question is are we there or are we at a much lower bound? Right? On the other hand, you can think about okay, so there, there, we have, you know, a plant growing in your garden. Well, that's occupying space, so that individual occupies that space. But on that plant, there are aphids. In that aphids are Buchnera and endosymbionts. Also in that aphid are parasitoid larvae, which we made up. Also in that aphid are hyperparasitoid larvae, eating the parasitoid larvae. Right? So you can keep packing more and more things in there. <coughs> but at some point, there will be a bound. Right? So we we'll argue about this. So that's good. So this sort of the discussion is what you, you think about when you're thinking about doing numerical simulations, both practical issues, I'm going to blow up my computer, and also issues of, so, you know, I have this idea of K. Does that make sense in this context? Can I believe that? Can I believe it enough that I can believe the results that come out or not? Right? Because if you believe in that, then you should see through time the number of species being constant, you know, with, with some fluctuations. You really think that's, that's, that's going to be the case? The fact that it's not the case, does that tell you something about how evolution happens? So, it's a good thing to have. Yeah? Um, is there uh, any evidence to support one of those theories more than the other? Do they have a different idea of what's coming that um, makes it kind of make sense? There's fitting of data to models, or models to data. So people will say, okay, let's assume there's a model that has a K. Let's assume there's a model that has no K, just exponential growth. Which model fits better? And you can say, okay, the data are more likely under this model. And so then I think that the small holds. And so there's been a bit of brouhaha about which models fit. And so the people who let, you know, papers published recently. Jeremy and I are actually working on a project where we're investigating. It's Jeremy. He's, he's going to be teaching class in a little while. For, but, oh, there. Um, and the cross creating something else. Um, but we're working on a model where we're trying to, well, we're a set of models. We're trying to say which set of models to best describe life. And so that's one way of doing it. But again, it's saying, okay, well, this model works better. But it's not the same as saying this model is how life actually evolves. Yeah. So here's some simulations they did. Right? So they generated those trees like you did, and then they did this binning into clades, even though they're not actually clades. They're, they're an ancestor in some, but not all descendants. That's the 70s. It's a crazy part. Um, but here you see the simulation they're doing. Okay, so you sort of and it looks sort of similar to sort of extant, to like actual empirical data, right? So say, okay, so this very simple model generates data that look like what we see, see nowadays, or see with actual data. So meaning, so meaning in this very simple model, the figures are explaining what we see. So you need to have, you know, complex explanations for the, these kinds of for this reason, this, this one next thing for this reason, this is a speciation event, just sort of this overall process. And so their intuition is informed by these simulations. However, <coughs> they did see some deviations, right? So looking at this, how does, how does this differ from the simulations? So one thing is, these are rep reptile clays, and reptiles are not monophotic groups. So um, right, so they don't, they, so they don't know, they didn't know that they were so that they're missing those lines. Good. What else? If they didn't have a line showing the KT, could you guess where it, where it was?
Some people say yes, some people say no. Those who say yes, why would, why would you think there is? Yeah, you can check the KT. Mm-hmm. Yep. So where that line is, you all these groups have university and suddenly stopping. Right? Someone's at the peak of the university. Right? Whereas other simulations, you know, we see we see some of that, right? But not nearly as much and not nearly according across like all these different groups. That's why in the abstract I said, you know, the KT looks like an exception to this null model. Right? But at times, you know, all through the tertiary, it seems to match the, the null model pretty well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's probably where they infer sort of ghost lineages, right? So they have fossils from here, they have fossils from here, they don't know what's going on here, but they figured out it wasn't re-evolution of this form de novo. Some of these things must have persisted, they don't know how many. Good. Okay. And there are things that sort of differ too, which they don't talk about in the paper, but you know, a lot of these look pretty rectangular, right? pretty constant through time. Whereas these are always from the now. So why, why would that be after? Okay. And what you could do is say, okay, logistic growth fits pretty well, but it doesn't explain this pattern. What process could generate that pattern? And you could make a model that does that. So maybe it's you have logistic growth for everything, and then you have different Ks within different groups that can evolve. <coughs> right? You can see, does this model fit better? Here's another approach using simulations that study evolution. Okay. In this case, they actually have computer programs themselves evolve. Right. So computer programs are you know, sets of functions. Um, and what they can do is have the program you know, duplicate functions, mutate functions, and then compete with other programs. Okay. It's like the matrix. Okay. <coughs> so here's you know, what they're doing. And you can actually download this and play with it yourself if you want. So here you can see, you know, some of this programs. That, so here's a phylogeny showing how the programs have changed through time. And so you can see you know, how many each one they have. And it's nice because you can do the simulation, which is basically simulating an entire genome evolving. And you can see how often do I increase my genome? When do I have sort of radical changes in population size? Um, that sort of thing. Okay, just by doing this evolutionary simulation of programs competing. Here's another thing, so if you go to the, your computer and use Firefox, here's something, I was, this is something I've been playing with as a way of teaching people about evolution. I actually did all the coding for this last night. It's freshly made. Um, so you can go, and go to this website and play with it. <coughs> what this just shows is a simulation showing how you can um, have evolution beating sort of non-evolution, right? And so, People play those like 2D tank games where things drive around, right? Here's a 2D tank game, but the tanks evolve, right? And those that score best have more offspring. Okay, and so you can play with it and see it running. Is there significance to like the triplet ones that are bonded with another triplet one? Yeah, it also involves flocking behavior. So they can find members of their own species and hang out with them. And how do the people like, kill the triplet They shoot lasers. So the turquoise ones should be lasers. I don't see the pink ones ever shooting lasers. Then your pink ones might. So, right, so this is interesting. So the, the purple one, the turquoise ones don't evolve. The, tur the pink ones do. But if the pink ones are always less fit, then they're just getting beaten up by the turquoise ones. Uh, but actually, if you click, you can actually introduce new variations. So you just click on the screen with the mouse, you can generate new variants of the purple ones and see how they do.
No, the reason you need Firefox for this is it uses Canvas elements that have text that other things don't use. <laughs> right, and so the, you know, the goal is eventually is you can have people design their own organism and then have evolution start <laughs> making it harder and harder for them to compete. Right? But you can see how a you know, very simple simulation you know, has, has probably a couple hundred lines of code um, can generate this sort of complex behavior of you know, things Blocking together and hunting and tracking things. Right. And if you reload it, it will generate a new population of turquoise ones. And so it could be that you, you know, if your, your first turquoise ones are incompetent, reload it, maybe the next one will be better. So some questions you can address with a simulation like this is does evolution always lead to higher fitness? So the, the purple ones evolve, the turquoise ones don't. Are the, are the purple ones always winning? And then you keep track of the number of kills through time. Right? What strategies can evolve? And do we have more flocking evolving? Do we have things being able to see at further distances? The circles show how far they can see. Any questions? So the outer circle is how far they can see. The inner circle is how far they can shoot. And if there's one circle, they can uh, see and shoot the same distance. But, the, but the, there's tr evolutionary trade-offs in the model. So if you can see really far, you can't shoot really far. Or can't run, also can't run very fast. So it's trade-offs in this way. Yeah, average for the species, but there's variation within the species for the purple ones. What? Okay. Any questions? So what I'd like to do now is have us generate a macroevolution simulation. I just think about what question in macroevolution that you know about that you want to simulate to get the answer to. Okay. And so things to think about when you do this are parameters are expensive. Right? So, I, so for example, I was in a group the, the, the play work group I was talking about. We were looking at what traits lead to evolution of play. Okay. And someone created a model to deal with evolution of play thinking that Organs to play to know how cooperative their, their species is, or their, their, their group is. And if they're cooperative, then they'll play with each other and help hunt big game. Otherwise, they'll hunt, hunt separately. Right? Well, this model had 30 or 40 parameters in it. So it's very hard to figure out which, which parameter leads to evolution of play. Right? Whereas very simple models like you know, uh, mutation selection balance, right? where you have just population size, mutation rate, selection. Right? Three parameters. That explains a lot of life. So when you're doing models like this, try to figure out how can I explain my data using as few parameters as possible. Right. So what questions do you want to address with the simulation? Okay. People agree with that? Okay. So what's the question with cannibalism? Not how to get away with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so what, what's so good? So let's talk about what we need to do for this model. So we have a population, and I'm trying to say so we have cannibalism being rare, right? So we have a population of so we have a population of non-cannibals. And then I have a cannibal here. What happens? Well, if it's a social creature, and it will probably eat more too than the non cannibals. Okay. Well, why would they have the behavior of killing? So 
mean, there's also threats of nature in species that don't really exist, right? That's the thing. So, I mean, what you're thinking about is this is anti cheater strategy already existing, where if you're killing us, we're going to come back and get you. This is the first time this has been seen, they probably won't evolve that strategy yet. So, our question could be will they evolve a strategy where they'll kill cannibals? You know, first, let's take the simplest assumption. You know, they're just you know walking around passively eating stuff, and then they don't really know what to do with how to deal with them. So then, this was the decision to make. If we went down the road of assuming we have an anti-cannibal response, then we would say, you know, in that scenario, would, would cannibals evolve? Right? Then it is an evolutionary sort of strategy. If we assume that they don't have an anti-cannibal strategy. What happens? So, you know, what, what parameters I need in my model? The fitness of the cannibal. Okay. So, fitness cannibal. The appetite of that cannibal. Okay. So, what does appetite mean? So, this is why modeling is good to say, okay, so you have the appetite you thing, but what, does it mean that, you know, they can only eat 15 non cannibals? Does it mean that every five Time step to eat something. Yeah. So what, what should we what should we put in our model for this? Frequency. Okay. So probably the cannibal event, for example. Okay. What else do we need in our model? Okay. Why do we need that? But so is things like the metabolic rate, things like that. So you think like, will, will that affect the behavior of the model? Okay. And it could. So if we have a model that has spatial structure, right, where where you are matters. If my kindle is here, it could kill off everything near it, and then nothing to eat. Right. So if you have a model that has mixing, then all that matters is how many craters it has in the whole population, and the spatial effects don't matter. So that's a decision we're going to have to make. What do you think? Spatial structure or no? Yes, no. Sure, okay. Spatial structure. Okay? So let's say we have a range at which we can do things. How would that affect the model? But does it just sort of rescale the probability of cannibalism? If all it is is like, you know, the number of cannibal events you have is probably trying it, probably succeeding, I just group those into one probability. Now, it might matter if the probability of success varies based on. You know, the density of prey items or something like that. So you know what I'm but you try to be as simple as possible to figure that out. Sure, you get to group things. Okay. What else do we need? <coughs> Is it the fitness of the non cannibal? Okay. Let's see. Can we just select it? How far the cannibal do you need? Okay, so yeah, so the big question about the simulation, how do you actually model genetics? And so it could be done to model it as a continuous straight. So you could have PC can go from zero to one. Right? So the probability of trying to attack could be zero, that makes you a non-cannibal, or it could be one if you're a cannibal, or it could you know, evolve and say, does it evolve to all the way to zero, or does it evolve to something that's going to be above zero and this community persists? Or you could say, okay, I have, I have one discrete trait that leads to it to the top. Or maybe they have two traits that have, you know, homozygotes or cannibals and heterozygotes on. Right? And I think that's what we need to do. So what do you think what do you think most biologists are realistic for what they're doing that is in this case? <coughs> I'm 
Mm-hmm. Right, then we want to want it to be heritable. So it came with husband offspring. Does it input does it involve this plus or minus something? Okay. You need to have some sort of variance there. So when you inherit it, you don't exactly have minus copy, you get something plus or minus. So the normal distribution, that's going to be deviation. It could be fleeing. So, if we're doing this spatial model, I see that Larry's having a bad time over here. He's a bad area to be in. Okay. So, we could put that in or we could leave it out and just see what happens about it. Um, so, we'll do it out for now. So, there's two ways to do this. So, those are typically modeling class. Right. How do you deal with this? What about the, the arms arm growth class? Oh. It's useful here. Make it some more. I do an equation for it. So you could do that. The problem with that here is that you have a spatial structure. Right, so a lot of those, the, those models assume that you know everything is very well mixed. The model of population chance model assumes everything is very well mixed. So you have a model that has structure, a hard model. Assume some sort of thing. The other thing that ends up being hard. So what we could do here is just you know, draw some stuff for us. We could do a, 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 a partial random simulation. Okay. <coughs> Good. We don't know how to, you know, having the analytical solution to this. And it, it also has a lot more of these factors about it. So I said, I, oh, I, I you know, wrote, wrote a game, ran it, and saw it. Programming, how to get a solution. You write an equation and say, yeah, the, the maximum of this equation is that you know, probably can be written in 0.1. Oh, check the math. Yep, beautiful. So if you have questions, you need to use these graphic simulations. <coughs> so then we set up, so the lingo we have two kinds of individuals. Or do we just have one? Do we just have because it goes from 0 to 1, right? So in the range of 0 to 1. So now we just need to figure out, um, we can calculate what these things are, or we can say, are you or not? What's the, what's the benefit for you? So how do you include the benefit from here? So it's like murder, but you know, I can use it for you. Okay. 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 Also, you need to be, you might be a more good for that. This is just not a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so it's often easier to simulate if you have an asexual piece. Right? You have to worry about only three. So in that case, the benefit for killing off your competitors isn't covered. You do have the benefit in a right? 
So, <coughs> for every, so for every time you eat, your F goes up by delta C. Okay. <coughs> How does fitness come into the model? They say, I have a five, I have a two. So what? Uh, it doesn't matter. Is there a differential reproduction? Yep. So I can do differential reproductions. I could say, you know, we're probably probably reproducing equals your fitness over the sum of all the fitnesses. Like, if you're much more fitter than everyone else, and you have you have a thirty chance of getting offspring, the fitness is zero. And that's all you would need. Right? And then you can just write a simple uh, discrete time thing that says. <coughs> I have an individual, right? Um, X, and it has various rates. It has its fitness, and it has its probability of cannibalism, and it has its X. And it's why. Right? And at each time step, what I do is say, okay, you're right here. You're surrounded by the other individuals. Okay? Are you going to have a range of these two things? Right? You say, okay, can you see this one? Yes? It's like our tank simulation, right? It has a range of which you can see. You see this one? You eat it. Probability, if you eat it, your fitness goes up by C. Do that for each individual, repeat, and the simulation play out. Okay. Um, still have six minutes. Can I do this now? Do this now. All right.